morning. I am personally happy that the sun has broken through the clouds. We've got beautiful blue skies. I pray that also the warmth of God's love is shining into your hearts. This is a special weekend. It's Father's Day weekend. And while it is uh, not for sure that all of us in the sanctuary are fathers, we probably have or had a father. And so this is a great weekend to uh, reach out to them and check out. Yesterday I was picking up the flowers from the florist and I asked the florist, is Father's Day even one-tenth of the orders as Mother's Day? And she said, no, this is a slower than normal weekend for us. She said, I think other than you, only two other people are picking up flower arrangements today. So she said, and then rightly so. For men, it's more about like barbecues and outdoor activities and things. So hopefully you get to do something with the men in your life whom you love. And um, whether they be near, whether they be far, a phone call or a, uh, you know, a FaceTime, something like that. We want to thank our guest organist, Jim Tyler, for being with us this morning, for blessing our hearts uh, with music. And we pray that this service will be a blessing to all of you. We want to pray for uh, those who are away, perhaps traveling, perhaps not feeling well. Uh, we want to greet those who are joining in over Zoom and over YouTube shortly after the fact. We pray that it is a blessing for everybody today. We want to thank all those who were involved in our kids' Sabbath school classes. Thanks to Griselda Schultz and thanks to uh, Mireya for the youth Sabbath school. Thanks to Clady Mia for the primary Sabbath school. We're so appreciative and the children are so dear to our hearts. We had a nice time having song service with them at 9.20 this morning in the youth room. And we'll also have a special story time here in the church service for them. Also, our Spanish group, uh, they started right early at 9 o'clock, heard some beautiful music, and uh, got to join part of the Sabbath School discussion over there. And uh, we are planning on having translation for whoever is translating. We've got a copy of the sermon, so if the translating person wants that, you're more than welcome to come to you. Several things going on in our schedule today. Our Pathfinder Club is meeting at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Thanks so much to uh, Elder Margarito for keeping that going. And we do understand that here over the summer we're going to have a club Sabbath. I don't know the specific day on that yet, but keep posted for that. Uh, also, this afternoon we always have our Sundown Bilingual Worship Program, Sociedad de Jovenes. Although this week it is not happening here, it usually happens in our fellowship hall. This time our youth and young adults are joining with AWA, which means always willing and able, and they're going to the Emmanuel Spanish Church. It's off All Road, you turn left on Lewis, and it's on Lewis Street. Uh, Lorena Salto has details, if you need to know, added details for that. Uh, if you are ever traveling or out of town, you can, of course, join us on Zoom or on YouTube after the fact. Several things coming up on our calendar. First of all, Monday is church board meeting, so all uh, church members, please uh, plan on being attended for that. Next Sabbath, we have a blood drive that's taking place in the Fellowship Hall from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. God says the life of somebody is in their blood, and God has given us more than we need. Yes, we can share a pint or two with someone else. If you would like to sign up to donate, you can go to redcross.org. Uh, you can help somebody who is in need of blood. You know, I always hear how they are low, and not everybody is able to donate. So if you're able, please uh, sign up at redcross.org. Also, next Sabbath, we're having our Outdoors uh, CrossFit Club hike. It's going to start at 5 p.m. up in Anaheim Hills. A three-mile hike to Robber's Roost. And that sounds a little bit daunting, but it's a lovely place, I understand. Looking forward to that. So come and enjoy fellowship. We will have more details in Wednesday's email and also in next week's bulletin. Yvette Hernandez and um, Joanne Lightford are in charge of that. And being on our radars, we are just nine days away from Vacation Bible School. Heroes VBS is coming up really soon. I hope that you saw the uh, display in the foyer and also picked up one of the flyers on the way in. If you didn't get one on the way in, take one with you on the way out. These are not primarily for you. These are for neighbor kids, classmates, co-workers. Uh, we're going to be going around the neighborhoods, my kids and I, this week, inviting friends. Uh, every night, not this coming week, but this, the following one from 6.15 to 8.30, we're going to have craft, we're going to have music, we're going to have food, we're going to have skits. It's going to be such a wonderful time, and we're going to rejoice. If you are not yet involved but would like to be speak with Jenny Hastings or Griselda Schultz, I'm sure they can plug it in So Shortly after that, July 3rd, we are hosting a car show in our parking lot. I don't know the last time you may have been to a classic car show or a hot rod show, but this is something that uh, Pastor Nate, uh, he has a church member from his pre 
previous church in Laguna Niguel who organizes this. Elder Michael and I went to one uh, three, four weeks ago, and we were surprised with how enjoyable it was, and calm and pleasant, and so we will be hosting one of these on July 3rd. It's family-friendly. Feel free to come this Sunday evening, July 3rd, right before July 4th. Also, our Christian summer camp up near Idlewild is functioning this summer, first time in three years after having been closed for the pandemic. We are so thrilled that our kids can go up and experience outdoor activities in the fresh air in a Christian environment, learning about Jesus. If that sounds like something that is good for your child, go to psrcamp.org. As of a week ago, I know they still had spots available. I hope they still do, uh, but check their psrcamp.org. And then, of course, we've got our, our regular things, Wednesday food bank distribution. That will be going on this Wednesday at 5 p.m. The next week is going, the food bank is going to be closed because of Vacation Bible School, both for the volunteer's sake as well as just having conflicting things going on at the same time. So food bank this Wednesday, but not next Wednesday, but then yes, every Wednesday after that. We also have our midweek prayer and book discussion group that meets uh, every Wednesday in 305, 306, or over Zoom. We're reading through the book, Patriarchs and Prophets. So join for a midweek recharge, some prayer time, and discussing the chapter on the Tower of Babel. Don't forget that you can always give your tithes and offerings, either with our deacons on the way out the door today or online. There's an app and a website called Adventist Giving. It's super easy. Whenever my wife and I get a payday, I go on there, and in about 40 seconds, I can have my giving taken care of. As you can see there, we need in local giving about $11,000 a month to balance the church budget. And we're so thankful that we've made. We surpassed that slightly, but that does not mean we can rest on our laurels. God is not uh, waxing and waning in His generosity to us. Neither should we be flattening in our commitment to Him, reflecting His goodness. So please keep those uh, donations coming, both tithes and offerings. We really appreciate it. So that all of our ministries can be fully funded. Several birthdays this week. We are uh, rejoicing with Brianna Palacios. Happy birthday. Uh, Mark Flores coming up in a few days. Joe Fuchida. And Reed Lightford coming up later in the week. So if you see some of them, wish them another year of God's blessing in the Lord. All right, we pray that everybody is well informed for what is going on throughout the week. Don't forget that there's a midweek pastor's update. If you don't currently get those Wednesday emails, uh, give me a text or a call or an email. My information is there on the back of the bulletin. You can even tear off a corner of your bulletin. Give me your email address. We'll make sure that you're well informed every Wednesday what all is going on with our church. That includes a devotional thought and the church prayer list. Praise the Lord of our big request for Wednesday has turned into a praise. Little girl Emily, who had the surgery, is doing very well. We're rejoicing over that. And we pray that you are blessed with your experience at the Anaheim SDA Church. Of course, if you are looking for a church family, we would love to get to know you better. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to have a conversation with me or one of the elders after church today. This time we're going to invite forward Elder Daniel Helley to give us our responsive reading and invite the Lord's Spirit in all of our hearts to be in a place of worship. Thank you. From the camera because it picks up on the camera. Welcome to church. Thank you. We are so glad that you are you. worshiping with us today. Um, our call to worship this morning will be responsive reading number 841 in your hymnals, uh, taken from Ephesians 1. Please read with me the bold print that is on your screens. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all the spiritual blessings of heaven in Christ. Before the world was made, He chose us, chose us in Christ to be holy and spotless and to live through love in His presence, determining that we should become His adopted sons through Jesus Christ for His own kind purposes to make us praise the glory of His grace, His free gift to us in the Beloved, in whom, through His blood, we gain our freedom, the forgiveness of sins. Such is the richness of the grace, which He has showered on us in all wisdom and insight. He has let us know the mystery of His purpose, 
the hidden plan he so kindly made in Christ from the beginning, to act upon when the times had run their course to the end, that he would bring everything together under Christ as head, everything in the heavens and everything on earth. And it is in him that we were claimed as God's own, chosen from the beginning, under the predetermined plan of the one who guides all things as he decides by his own will, chosen to be for his greater glory, the people who would put their hopes in Christ before he came. Now you too, in him, have heard the message of the truth and the good news of your salvation and have believed it. And you too have been stamped with the seal of the Holy Spirit of the promise, the pledge of our inheritance, which brings freedom for those whom God has taken for his own to make his glory great. And now it's time for our opening hymn.
light, the darkness in this world is a lot. It's too much, right? So many things going on. But God never wants us to forget. He is our light. No matter how dark it gets in this box, in this box, it's dark in there, right? Jesus is our light. Okay, everybody, close your eyes. We're gonna have a word of prayer. Close your eyes. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us your son Jesus to be the light in our world. Please help us to remember that you're there for us, that you are our Father in everything that we do and everything that we go through. You are always there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before these kids go back to their seats, we want to give them the promise. And really give them the these kids are going to be looking for a hand drop of fridge, for coins and small bills, with pictures of people on the side of those two.
Dear Lord, we marvel that you would continue extending your grace to us when we continually frustrate you and annoy you, but that's how great a God you are, and we are privileged to come into your presence. Lord, you know our difficulties, you know our anxieties, you know our frustrations and our stresses, and we want to hand them all to you. I'm so thankful for the verse in Scripture that says we can cast all of our burdens and cares upon you because you care for us so much, dear Jesus. Help us to truly trust in that care and in that love and to internalize it and to make it part of who we are. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, for those who are suffering. Some are suffering physically in the body, dear Heavenly Father. We pray for you to extend your healing hand from heaven to give strength and endurance. We're so glad that Sister Esther Sellers had her 89th birthday this weekend. We're so thankful that Brother Gerald had his uh, birthday also this week, both of whom are shut in, that they are trusting in you, and they are prayer warriors from where they're from. We pray for those who are having procedures, Lord. We pray for Sister Gloria. We pray for uh, Emily over the sea. We're so thankful that she has improved, and we pray for these people to come back to full health. Lord, we also pray for those who are mourning the loss of family members recently. We pray for the Leon and Flores families in the passing of dear Nair. We pray for the Wolford family as they're missing dear Millie. And we pray for the Vances as they're missing dear Bonnie. Some of these families have moved on from being part of our congregation, Lord, but they took part of our hearts with them, and we mourn with them as they are missing their family members, Lord. We pray for your divine comfort. Lord, we know that not all the problems are visible or physical. Some of us are in despair. Some of us have relationships that are breaking down. Some of us don't know how we're going to fill the gas tank for the next time, dear Heavenly Father. We want to claim your promise. Dear Jesus, thank you for freeing us from the worry of worldly things. You said we can focus entirely on your kingdom, on your righteousness, and you would see fit, dear Heavenly Father. You would see to it that all the other things we need in life are taken care of. It can be hard with our human eyes to see just how that can be, dear Father, but we take it in faith, dear Lord, and we ask you, we entrust ourselves to you to please take care of us as we go about the business of our daily tasks, our daily work, and also the daily business of um, beholding your kingdom, focusing on it, pursuing it, dear Lord. We are so privileged to know you and to be in a community of faith, and I want to pray for those who are not able to be here today for one reason or another, Lord, that they would be brought back to us soon. I want to pray that our visitors would feel welcome, dear Lord, and that they would know that there's a community of faith here extending the hand of friendship anytime they need it. Uh, we pray, dear Lord, for uh, our sisterhood of churches around Southern California and beyond. Uh, so glad, Lord, to be part of the body that's worshiping you in spirit and in truth on your holy day. We love you and we pray that this service is pleasing in your sight. And we pray that every member would come away from this service blessed as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
in John 1, 9 through 13. That's again, that's John 1, 9 through 13. I invite you to turn there with me in your Bibles or devices. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. May the Lord's blessing be added to the hearing, the understanding, and the doing of his word. Amen.
kind of in the order in which we experience them is, first of all, love toward parents, right? We're a little kid, we're a toddler, we look up and we experience love. Love between siblings, kind of our first experience of a crossways love, and certainly sibling love has a lot of strife in it, but hopefully over the years a real bond is made there that carries on into adulthood. A third dimension would be love between friends, also, which is a crosswise, but that's the first dimension of love that you get to pick who comes into your more intimate circle, yes? And then as we start growing up, there's also romantic love, yes? Although we are a kissy kissy type of love that we experience, yes. The Greek language actually has an improvement on English. Greek language, which is the language of the New Testament and the Bible, has four words for love. They have phileo love, which is like dear, intimate friendship love. There's eros love, which is passionate love. That's where we get the word erotic from. There's storge, which is empathic love, when you feel empathy. And agape, which is unconditional, self-sacrificial self love. And this is the one the scripture talks about the most. Hopefully we experience agape love in Christian community here in the church. But probably the last of the new kinds of love that we experience in life chronologically is the one where we start, we talked about upward experiencing love and a crosswise experiencing love, then comes later in life a downward experience of love. I'm talking about parental love. When a new little being comes into the world and it's all your own, it's the biological blending, the intertwined DNA of you and your most beloved partner. And it's looking up at you with that adorable little face. <laughs> this little baby in your arms is a precious bundle of pure potential, but at the same time it's completely hopeless and dependent. And in large part, it's a, it's a blank slate. You will be in charge of instilling a worldview and values into this person. And it's a big responsibility, and it can be daunting, and it can be scary. But at the same time, the love that washes over you. I remember shortly after Hime had given birth, and had had some skin-to-skin -skin contact time with the baby, and she was resting. I got to take my newborn into a private room for some one-on-one -on -one together time. And I remember a wave of a new type of love washing over. I remember singing softly to my baby. And I remember wondering how the little neurons were firing in that little baby brain processing the stimulus among so much other stimulus that it had that first day in the outside world. If you're a parent, you no doubt know something of what I am referring to in the experience of parental love. There are, of course, many, many cases of parental love being expressed in the scriptures. Sometimes it's expressed as pride and joy. Think of Jacob with Joseph, his uh, preferred son. We talked about that a little bit in Sabbath school today, also last week. And also sometimes that parental love in Scripture is expressed in heartache and devastation. King David had a couple examples of those. But one Bible character I'd like to focus on for just a few minutes this morning is Enoch. You remember Enoch, yes? The seventh from Adam who walked with God famously, he's very well known. We actually read and discussed this just a few weeks ago in our midweek prayer and discussion group. Ellen White says in the book Patriarchs and Prophets that before Enoch became a father, he was a good man and a righteous man. But when he had a child, when he experienced this new dimension of love in a big way, his heart just <laughs> overflowed with love. And I can imagine God looking down from heaven. I can imagine Him conversing within the Trinity and maybe rhetorically asking the angels, Look! Look at what's happening to Enoch! What else does he need? What does he lack? Let's just bring him up here right now! And that's exactly what God did. Scripture says in Genesis 5, 24, Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more, because God took him Wow! Experiencing heaven early! Can you imagine it? And parenthood, specifically fatherhood in his case, had a significant part in that love relationship, that walking with God ever more closely. It's profound to consider. 
parenthood, specifically fatherhood, I think can be, and I think is intended to be, a wake-up call to responsibility to those who may have been living their lives a little too loosely. <laughs> Plenty of young men these days love the party scene and all that's included in it, but when a baby comes into your life, there should be sirens going off in your conscience, yes? yes. There is a precious, defenseless being who is dependent on you. It's time to straighten up and be responsible, insists the conscience. Yet do all men answer that call and rise to the occasion? No, all too often men shirk their responsibility. They leave the baby to be raised by the mother alone while they go out and continue their fast, selfish living. And they miss out on the blessings. And other people are harmed in the wake of that. And I am fully convinced that every absentee father will answer for that on judgment day. For many men who shirk their responsibility, that will be one of the biggest points in their life in which God will say, I was calling you to something just then. I was calling you to wake up and to be a man. And what did you do with that call? And some will stand before God and speak to us. And they will not know the depth of how they messed up until then. I pray there are none of those cases in my hearing today. What do you say, friends? Is that us? No, no, never. But just in case there are a few, I want to assure you, it is never too late to pick up a phone and begin an attempt at reconciliation with that child, with the parent of that child. You can avoid that scenario that I just described on your own. There is still time. A great Christian movie came out several years ago called Courageous, regarding responsibility in fatherhood. Many of you have perhaps seen it. You can uh, possibly stream it here this weekend if you have time. It is hugely appropriate for Father's Day. It is, rightly, rated PG-13, so don't think it's for little eyes just because it is Christian. I'm certainly waiting until my kids are 13 to show them that movie. But in large part, the Courageous movie is about standing up taking responsibility for what God has given men to be present and contributing to fathers. And in that, there is great fulfillment. Any responsible father here in the congregation today will tell you that raising up children with my wife has been one of the greatest, the grandest, the most fulfilling, the most rewarding aspects of my whole life. Yes, of course, it has its annoyances, it has its worries, it has its stresses, has its fears as well, but it only has those things because you are so intimately invested. So please, men, please don't let the fears, the inconveniences, the dauntingness of responsibility make you miss out on probably the single greatest fulfillment that God has for you in life. Say amen with me if you are with me, if you are all in for the fulfillment of fatherhood that God has for you in your life. Congregation, amen. Praise the Lord. But that, of course, is not the ultimate fulfillment of fatherhood in life, is it? Because there's someone else in Scripture, beyond all the earthly fathers, beyond the genealogies of who begat who begat who begat who, there's someone else in Scripture that's called Father, isn't there? Oh, and he's a good father, isn't he? He's a great father. He is a magnificent father. The fact that God, who is far and away grander than any earthly father, far beyond any conception we can fathom, the fact that he has chosen this language to relate to us. Several possibilities for how God could relate to us, aren't there? He could frame himself as the master, talking down to the servants. Certainly could do that. That illustration is used in Scripture somewhat. God could frame himself as the titan, looking down on the minions or the peons, yes? God could utilize language of the boss, speaking to the employee. We certainly had those relationships in Bible times. But the fact that God primarily chooses this one, chooses father to child, 
Yes, there is authority there, but there is also great commitment and love, is there not? God uses a term, chooses to primarily use a term of intimate, benevolent, selfless, over the moon, heart gushing with love illustration. And we, in this illustration, are far more than working for a paycheck or to satisfy the master. In this illustration, we are the dependent, helpless, often annoying, often stumbling subject of the Father's love. But beloved, oh, so beloved, ooh, I can just pick you up and smother you with kisses all day. You ever feel like that with your kids? Scriptures say, Psalm 103, verse 13, As a father has compassion on his children, so Yahweh, so the Lord, has compassion on those who revere him. Amen, dear church? That's from the pen of King David. King David got it. Yes, the illustration of God to humanity is like a father to beloved children. And Jesus got it. He understood it. He said in Matthew 7, verses 9 through 11, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? It's like Jesus is saying to the congregation, it's like he's saying, come on guys, think of your own relationship with your kids, how you desire good for them, you help them, and you encourage them, and you are flawed as a parent. How many times do you have to magnify up and perfectionate up that motive for a perfect God, benevolent in all his ways, how in the world do you not think God is going to bless you if you help and bless and encourage your children? It's common sense, Jesus is saying, if you think about it rightly. And so, how profound, dear brothers and sisters, that God uses this language as his primary descriptor of how he views us, feels about us, relates to us. Relationship language in the scriptures, friends. It's not dry theology. It's not cold, ritualistic language. It's, I love you. As a father. That is the fulfillment of fatherhood. If you are a father, or perhaps a mother, take heart. You are already very familiar with how God feels about you, about all of us, about the world, how He feels. Head over heels, over the moon for, wanting the best for, cheering us on, yearning and pining, yet so often frustrated so often exasperated, as we can read in the scriptures with Israel, so often upset and angry when we fall short repeatedly of all He has envisioned for us. But He strives, doesn't He? Oh man, and He does not give up. Though we were to turn our back on Him a thousand times, He is still there, right behind us. Come on home, come on home. Oh, won't you come home? Think of the prodigal son story, so famous, Luke chapter 15. Man, is there any more powerful parable about God's love and His willingness to forgive? And there it is, couched in the language of a father and a son relationship. Servants, slaughter the fat calf, hire the musicians. We are having a party. My son was dead, but now he's alive, he was lost. Enoch, who we mentioned earlier, walked with God partially because, could be said, he experienced God's side of the love relationship. He saw a bit of the upper, looking down benevolently with love to the lower, got to see it from the upper side, and oh, boom, his heart just exploded over the moon with love. That's how it should be. That's how we are all called to understand better and maximize our concept of God's love for us when we have children. It's one of God's biggest intended illustrations in Scripture that we can understand Him and how He feels about us. 
And I'll tell you, it protects me from many things that I might otherwise be inclined toward. A harsh God? A legalistic God? Yes, sometimes my kids need firmness, need even what can be perceived as harshness. They need discipline, they need rebuke. But Scripture makes it clear. Revelation 3, verse 20, Those who I love, I rebuke and discipline. Never question whether it is happening in love. Never question whether it is happening with the intention that you can grow in character from it. Just as a good parent guides the footsteps of their child. The most loving parents are not the most permissive parents. Is that right? Any teacher of any class knows that the biggest brats in school are the ones with the two permissive parents. And God will not be a two permissive parent toward us. Amen? Amen. Our scripture reading today, thank you Brother Darrell for it, emphasized that through faith we can become not mere children of our fathers, not mere descendancy of our physical genealogy, but nothing less. Think of the profundity, brothers and sisters. Nothing less than the children of the one true God. To think about it. Amen. And the same author John in his later letter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, the same John invites us to think, to bask, to reflect on it. The imagining, the beholding of that love when he invites us. Behold, behold means like savor it with me. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us. Some translations say given to us. I give it to us too, but I like the word lavish. It's like putting too much frosting on a cake, right? He's lavished it upon us. That we should be what? Called children of the most high God. And that is what we are. We should be recognizing what we are, yes. What a thing. So take a moment, friends. If you haven't done it in a while, take a moment to snuggle in that truth for a little bit. Wrap yourself in it. Warm yourself up in it. Beloved child of the one true God of heaven. That's what I am. That's how much he loves. A beloved child of Daddy. Abba. You know that term from the scripture, don't you? Jesus brought a new conception for how to relate to God. The Jewish people had the concept of the high and exalted and mighty and extolled God, which is very true. But Jesus came calling his father, Abba, Daddy. Literally one of the first words a toddler would say whenever they recognize and identify. Daddy, Abba. And the scripture says that by God's spirit, we too can cry out, Abba, Daddy, Father. It's beautiful, isn't it? I could just reflect on that all day. God wants to be my Abba, and I'm his toddler. Scraping the knee, crying, needing picking up again, dusting off, but he's so proud. How much more tragic is it then, friends, when fathers on earth shirk their duty? when they renege on what they should be to their little ones. It's terrible, right? Because it destroys one of the biggest illustrations God has intended. Fatherlessness is absolutely an epidemic in our society. I think it got more attention in the 80s than it does today, 80s and 90s, not because it's lessened, but because it's gotten all the more common. It's all the more expected in society. It's sad to say it's pretty normal, you know? When I look at my classroom full of students, I assume that probably half of them are living in a single parent household. I hope I'm not overestimating, but I think it's safer to overestimate than underestimate. And other crises, crises have dwarfed the fatherlessness crises, haven't they? Drug crises, gun crises, mental health crises. These things are all more urgent, seemingly, than the fatherlessness crisis. But I do, wonder, I do wonder what percentage of these other crises have their roots in absentee fatherism. I'm sure that not every drug addict or mass shooter or suicidal person has an absent spot in their hearts where a father should be. But I'm also just as sure it's double or triple the number of father absenteeism in the general society. And what is particularly sad with absentee fatherism is that people tend to form their ideas of God from what they got from their fathers growing up. Both parents, yes, but it's more the fathers. If father 
on earth is warm and comforting, they're more likely to be inclined. God is warm and comforting. If Father on earth is cold and distant, Father in heaven, cold, distant. If earthly dad is abusive, maybe God's a tyrant. Maybe I hate him. If earthly dad is just absent, abandoning, maybe God was never there at all. That's atheism. Or maybe God once was there, but he's gone somewhere else now. That's deism. The idea that God set things up, but then went off to do something else. And it happens with families. And I guess part of me doesn't blame people for projecting that onto God, the pain that they have from their family. But how much more important for that to be prevented? Amen? I think it's a loop, friends. I think it's both a cause and effect. I think faithlessness increases absentee fatherism, and I think absentee fatherism increases faithlessness. And I don't know which came first. It's kind of a chicken or the egg question. But I know one thing. It's a spiral I do not want to be a part of. Yes? Rather, I want to fulfill God's intended purpose for fathers with my own kids. That's the very least I can do. And I'm always so happy when I see a male teacher in elementary grades at school. Because I think kids from single mom households can get an example shown to them of what a responsible man looks like. And I'm so glad we have one at our Christian elementary school over in Orangewood. I think it's even more profound in a Christian school context. It's even more profound. The kids of single moms can see a godly example of a responsible man for those kids to look at. Like so many things in life, it's such a beautiful vision, friends. Father, but it makes it oh so tragic when we fall short of it. And I have to tell you, all too often I'm embarrassed for my half of the species, you know. I don't mean to end this sermon on a melancholy note. I get discouraged at how we fall short of God's vision. But we've got to do what God does, right? Not give up. Amen? Not give up on society. Not give up on God. I hope we can at least say praise the Lord that for the ones who are fatherless in this life, they can look to their Heavenly Father. Replace that void in their life. I pray that every single person from a fatherless home would look to Scripture and would adopt God as their daddy. Adoption is another strong concept in Scripture. Yes, being brought into a household you are naturally a part of. And to belong to that Heavenly Father just as much as a family-born child born to that Heavenly Father who wants to scoop them up, scoop them in His arms and hug them, and wants to metaphorically teach them to walk and to run and to ride a bicycle, and to bring them into the family of faith, into His kingdom, who wants to embrace Him and own them and call them His beloved. Jeremiah 31.3 says, and then this is in the midst of the frustration of Israel being so rebellious, but through the prophet Jeremiah, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And I have to believe, friends, in the Holy Spirit drawing people who, from an earthly standpoint, have every excuse to give up on God because of their family circumstance. But God still, over the years, you know, through, you know, He's knocking on the door of their hearts. And maybe some of the knocking and some of the attracting, the loving kindness drawing can be through some of us, yes? Would we be open our hearts to be part of the drawing, attracting of God toward His community of faith that is coming to save? So friends, will you answer the call today? First of all, will you commit to experiencing the fulfillment of earthly fatherhood in your own life? If you are a father, if you're yet to be a father, if you're something else, an uncle or a coach or a teacher or an aunt, everybody has somebody of a lower level that they can love and experience God's side a little bit with. Will you commit to whatever your own relationships are to try to understand God through your love to ones that are below you? Yes. And the second level. Whether or not you're a father, would you let yourself be beloved, be cherished and treasured by your heavenly father who loves you, who holds nothing back for you, who would even lay down his life for you? Because that's not just empty words, he did it, you know. He gave his one and only precious beloved son that whosoever of his earthly children would look and 
accept and believe that they would have a new destiny, a new future, a new family, amen? And nothing less than God's glorious, everlasting kingdom. We are perpetually children of the Most High King. I pray a blessing on you the remainder of this Sabbath day. At this time we're going to stand and sing our closing hymn, A Child of the King, number 468 in our hymn. Full heart, full voice, and full spirit. Child of the King.
that we belong, that we are beloved, that we are part of a family that is destined for glory and has you at the helm. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us unconditionally, even when we fall short, even when we reject you, dear Heavenly Father. Certainly the earthly fathers in my hearing have experienced some of that with their own children, Lord. But just as a father is always welcome to, uh, open to welcome his child home with open arms, you, dear Heavenly Father, you are magnificent grace in your abundance, provision to your Heavenly Father. We recognize that we are dependent on you for every good thing. The oxygen we breathe, the food that is going to be on our plate shortly, and the, the very muscles uh, uh, contorting in our bodies and the neurons firing in our brains. This is all from you, dear Heavenly Father. We give it back to you in appreciation, and we pray, dear Heavenly Father, a blessing on the remainder of our Sabbath day. We pray all this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for attending with us today. We encourage you to stay for the post loop that uh, Brother Jim has prepared for us. We also have a prayer group around the circle, so don't hesitate to come up if you've got a need. Our deacons will be at the door with the offering plate for anybody who wants to give their tithes or offerings. And I'll be on the courtyard for any conversation.